you have a lot of people confused. Why? This, when you could have had... Schnell? Ja, in England, nennen Sie es das Fastback. I'm sorry, this isn't intending to be an all rover channel, but it does kind of appear that I am going a bit that way at the moment, but don't worry. Very soon, next time, I'll do something that's not a rover. Abnormal service will be resumed, and I will steer away from the Viking ship of, of glory that was once Britain's pride. I looked at a Ford last week, come on, give me a break. But this car is, yes, obviously another rover. Sorry. It's not one I've bought, so don't worry, I've not added to the fleet this week. I've not persuaded a friend to buy it, or arm wrestled a friend to buy it, because they needed a car and they thought I might be doing a favour. But it is for sale. Um, I'll put some contact details in the place below. It's for sale privately at the moment, but it's with the garage who are looking after it today. Um, and it is a September 1990 Rover 800. Being September 1990, that is the tail end of the first series, Series 1, Generation 1, whatever you want to call it, pre-facelift. Let's call it that. Rover 800 series. This is an 820 SE, which is basically the four cylinder single point injected uh, fleet version, the, the, the version that's got you know, a relatively economical engine and plenty of toys. So your middle manager is going to be happy with his uh, company car tax and also look good in the company car car park when he's got his electric sunroof and windows to play with. As you can see, and if your German is as good as mine, then you will notice it is a fastback. This is a not only attractive, but practical proposition, which serves a number of purposes. Um, it means that your saloon has become extremely useful. You can put a lot of gear in the back of that car if you're a family or antiques dealing executive. Um, and also from this particular angle at the rear three quarter, it does really kind of echo back to the SD1 that it replaced. You can see that Rover DNA in this corner far more than in the saloon or even the coupe versions. These cars were introduced in 1986 and development started in 1981. British designer Gordon Sked did the penmanship, designing this rather attractive um, and quite conservative uh, bodywork on this thing. As most people know, the development of this car was shared with Honda. Honda desperately needed a large full-size car to enter the American market with, to take on Toyota and Datsun and the home market obviously as well in, in the States. And Britain, or Rover specifically, needed a, um, a large full-size car to replace the SD1, which was by 1981 uh, five years old. So the development cycle times means it's going to be a full decade old by the time it was actually replaced. So Honda came up with the V6 engine, the manual automatic gearboxes, and Rover came up with the electrics, sorry, and the four-cylinder engine. Both cars, the Honda Legend and the Rover 800, shared the same floor pan and the basic substructure, but then the individual companies clothed it in their own unique bodywork and their own interiors to give them their own unique style and character. And Hondas destined for the UK market were also built in Cowley alongside their Rover brothers, sisters. It's actually a really nice bit of design that he's come up with. It's a very simple, clean, um, elegant bit of work. It's very nicely proportioned. It all kind of holds together visually really nicely from every angle. There's no sort of a slightly ungainly, awkward position as you walk around the car and find it looks a bit too long or a bit too quirky. Everything hangs together really nicely. Um, and, of course, and being a pre-facelift car, it's this lovely, clean front end of the bonnet. There's none of that chrome grill thing that the facelift cars got in I think 1992 or 91. So there's no kind of, there's no pretension, no, there's no pretense of it being something it's not. It's a very nice, elegant, modern car for a, you know, the modern age, the 80s and the 90s were, you know, cutting edge modern stuff. Forget that chrome stuff of the past. They want new and exciting impact bumpers and wraparound lights, none of this chrome nonsense. Let's not look backwards, let's look forwards and do something exciting. And they did, and this looks good. It hangs together really well. It's very simple, very clean, elegant, nice long straight lines to the whole car, which is a very angular car as you look at it with very few curves. Clearly I'm not alone in thinking that because in 1990 alone, 29,460 of these things sold. Um, and overall, 317,000 of these were built. Not 820 SEs, just the entire 800 range, just to be clear. So here we have it, Rover's M series four cylinder petrol engine. It's single point fuel injection, but does have 16 valves. You've got three choices under the bonnet here. You've got the two litre petrol, two and a half litre diesel, and a 2.7 litre V6, which is the one to go for. Someone didn't with this one, they chose a two litre petrol, but it's not the entry level carburetor. If you watch Hubnut, you'll be familiar with that particular car, which is as basic as they absolutely come. I think 120 horsepower. This is a single point fuel injection, which I believe makes 136 horsepower. And I guess it's probably a bit more reliable as well. It doesn't quite tune quite so often, perhaps, I don't know. 
I'm sure it gets better economy, and it's probably faster with a 0 to 60 time of apparently 12 seconds. I haven't tested that yet, we'll go and find out in a minute. Inside this thing, it is very rovery indeed. There's lots of the stuff that makes you think, hmm, this is a British car, not a Honda. For example, wood. There's lots of stuff that makes it look very much like a British Rover and not a Japanese Honda. For example, the um, slightly fallen off seat back adjuster and the very nice wood. Two very British institutions when it comes to car making. There's a lot of ugga duggers going on over there. The wood inserts are proper lovely burr walnut and look absolutely magnificent. And they go quite well with this nice blue velour and corduroy. Investigating the spec a little bit further, I'm going to come inside because I'm getting sunburned on the back of the head. We've got a fair few toys. We've got a Philips radio cassette with auto reverse, which would have been quite exciting back in 1990. Auto reverse, that's a good thing. A large space here below the digital clock, which I guess might have been for a, the next level of, um, of audio. Perhaps here you could have had a bigger radio with a graphic equalizer or a CD player perhaps. I, I don't know, obviously an ashtray because everything had an ashtray back in the 80s because everyone smoked themselves to death. Only a five-speed gearbox, interestingly. You'd think on a big car like this, it'd have six-speed, but I guess we're just slightly predating six-speed gearboxes, aren't we? And down here, we have the button for the electric sunroof. Do I dare open it? Oh yeah, that works. I'm gonna shut that again because it's very bright outside today. Here in the centre we've got our heating and ventilation controls which have hot and cold and will distribute between your feet, your face and the windscreen and go from zero to three on the dial. However, one thing which is notable by its absence is air conditioning and I would really expect a car of this nature to have aircon on it being, you know, SE is kind of mid-range. I'm guessing they're saving it for the Sterling and Vitesse perhaps, I don't know. I can understand not being on the, 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 the two litre base model but I think an SE really ought to have had aircon on it. Oh well, moving on. We also have a brightness adjuster for the dials here, which is very prominently placed for a very, very unimportant control. I'm sure something else like hazard warning lights, for example, would have been good there instead of the microscopically small button just there. I'm thinking big hazard light button there, tiny dial there. That must have been better the other way around. Over here in the corner, we've got our rear fog light. Oops, oh dear, that panel is rather mobile. If it'll stay still long enough, we've got a rear fog light. And rear wiper and washer. The stalks here for your indicators and lights and wipers on the front are really quite interestingly sculpted. They're big slabs that look a bit like um, permanent markers or highlighter pens uh, that are stuck out the side. I wonder if that was the inspiration for them. Oh, and finally, on the door over here, I've got my four electric windows, so that's quite cool. Four, four electric windows and electric sunroof and electric mirrors. This, you know, in terms of toys in 1990, this was pretty loaded. One thing that does puzzle me is down here on the door, there's a blanking plate. I have no idea what this blanking plate is for. Would it be a tiny, tiny ashtray? Would it be a reflector or a light? Maybe in the American market, you have to have a light in the door for the Sterling versions, but they couldn't afford two different door mouldings. So one for the UK market gets a blanking plate and one for the American market gets uh, a light in there. Very possible, I'd imagine. Oh, also worth noting, we have uh, mid-range and tweeters in the doors. So I'm expecting that if I had the code to the radio, there's a lot of history with this car, so it will exist. I'd have um, pretty good sound. It's interesting to look at a car this big and this executive and this kind of posh, and look at this little key. It's not like the key on like a Porsche, which is like a tiny model of the car almost, with multiple buttons and a radio linked to your phone so you can look on the app how your car's doing. This is oops, the same little flappy thing you get on a Metro. But hey, I guess it works. Right, let's go and take this thing for a drive. Okay, let's go and take this thing for a drive. First of all, sitting here, the seats are notably comfortable. They are big velour armchairs and they are absolutely wonderful. They're quite firm actually, firmer than I thought they would be. But 
the fabric is nice and soft and the spongy filling is nicely supportive. So they are a nice place to be, first of all. That's, that's a good start. The steering is power assisted, obviously. A big heavy car, you're not gonna go far without power assistance on this thing. It's nice, it's light, it's got a fluid feel to it. Very pleasant indeed. And the car just kind of wafts over bumps. It's not bumpy, it's not crashy. And the engine, it's really, I don't know if you can hear it on the microphone, but it's really rather quiet. It's uh, very, very civilized indeed. Yeah, for a, for a big car, the controls feel very light. Oh my word, there is a 1940s American Jeep coming the other way and none of the cameras are pointing towards me. How cool is that? And the rear camera might call that. Yeah, so all the controls are very, very light indeed. And it's very easy to place this thing on the road. Now, considering that this is a big executive saloon from a relatively uncool brand, it's had quite the impact on popular culture over the years. And there's Alan Partridge driving his 825, which was, of course, uh, the <coughs> Partridge or Cook Pass Babridge, I think, was the, uh, the clean version of it. Uh, should I have to? No, I don't need to turn that. Um, and, of course, um, there was that fantastic advert from the 80s I opened this video with, which I'm sure you recognised. That really, one of the most quoted adverts ever. Schnell? Yeah, in England they call it the fastback. I love that advert. Everyone does. You mentioned Rover 800? That comes to mind instantly. And of course the band, the Chainsmokers, their song Closer, they sing Baby Pull Me Closer in the back seat of your Rover. The last Rover that was sold in America was the Sterling, the 800 series. So clearly the Chainsmokers are referring to a Rover 800. And that was number one around the world for weeks. This is a very famous car. Unlike the convertibles and the Tomcat, there's like no scuttle shake and no rattles at all. This feels really well screwed together. Now in terms of ride and fit and finish and uh, you know, even equipment levels for the, for the time it was made. This all feels appropriately posh and well screwed together. Now the engine is a good engine. As a horse, I'm gonna have to slow down and rejoin this thought in a moment. It looks a bit skittish. Yeah, the engine is a good engine and it feels kind of sporty, but at the same time, it doesn't really feel powerful enough for a car this big. It moves, it moves happily. If you're not in a hurry, this is a nice engine and it's very smooth. The gearbox is quite nice, it's got a little notchy feel to it. A little thump into each gear, but it's uh, easy to manoeuvre its way through. I'm not really able to put this car through its handling dynamic paces on these back roads today because there are a lot of horses out for some reason. Although, to be honest, after a short drive in this car, that's no bad thing because this doesn't really feel like the kind of car that wants to be hustled. It's definitely a cruiser. If you are thinking of using this car as a daily driver, then absolutely it's the one to have because it's gonna be nice and fuel efficient, it's gonna be reliable, cheap to, uh, to maintain. All in all, this is a really nice package. Bear in mind, the prices of these cars have now fallen as low as they're absolutely ever gonna be. A tatty one would be under a grand. This one, I think, which is really quite nice and it's got a fair bit of MOT left on it, is about 2,000 pounds with the guy who's selling it at the moment. In terms of whether to hang on to a car like this, I, I'd say yes, it's time to go and buy one. They're never gonna get cheaper than this. I've probably hit rock bottom already, if I'm honest. And they're only gonna get more valuable from this point on because there are very few indeed. Okay, they made about 317,000 of them, I think I said earlier. But how many of those are actually left? Not many, I'm sure. An awful lot of those are gonna be generation two as well. Not the early ones like this, pre-facelift, which I think is a prettier car, to be honest. Sharper lines, no grill on the front. I think this is the one to have. If you're interested, I'll put an email address down below. It is seriously for sale. It was offered to me. I would like it. I would actually, I would drive this quite happily. The boot on this is enormous. I could use this as a daily quite happily. 
thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed yet another Rover. Sorry about that. It was meant to be an MX-5 today, but that sold and uh, this turned up, so that's what I did. Um, please hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. If you didn't like it, just walk away quietly and keep it to yourself. You don't need to tell everyone how much you didn't like it. There's a lesson there. That tolerance and happiness. Thanks for watching anyway. See you next time. Now I'm gonna have to give it back and want to go and buy it, aren't I? I wonder if any of my friends need a big car at the moment. Hmm.